Good evening. Welcome to the Wheeler Centre's Fifth Estate series. Uh, my name is Sally Wahaft and I'm talking to you tonight from sad old Melbourne, but uh, thrilled to bits to be with you. There have been few highlights during this pandemic. But uh, one of them has been that, of course, new books and essays continue to be published. And tonight we have two really distinguished authors whose works have been, uh, one way or the other, years in the making, but were finished uh, very recently during lockdowns uh, with an awareness that the global pandemic that we're living with um, is going to also impact on climate change policy. Marion Wilkinson is one of the great investigative journalists. She's a member of the Australian Media Hall of Fame, worked for the Sydney Morning Herald as its Washington correspondent, uh, environment editor and deputy editor. She's also worked as a senior reporter and executive ABC's Four Corners. She was a co-author with David Ma of Dark Victory in 2003 and the author of The Fixer, The Untold Story of Graham Richardson. And uh, her latest book is The Carbon Club, uh, published by Lynn Unwin. Judith Brett is one of our most distinguished thinkers. She is Emeritus Professor of Politics at La Trobe University, a former editor of Mianjin, columnist for The Age. Judith won the National Biography in 2018 for the enigmatic Mr Deacon. Her other books include From Secret Ballot to Democracy Sausage, Australian Liberals and the Moral Middle Class and Robert Menzies' Forgotten People. She's the author of four Relaxed and Comfortable, Exit Right, Fair Share, and her latest, The Coal Course, Curse, The Coal Curse, Resources, Climate, and Australia's Future, uh, published, of course, uh, by Black Ink. Uh, you know, before we go on, that uh, Readings Bookshop is our official bookseller for all of the Wheeler Centre's online events. So um, they can find you not just these. Uh, recent publications, but all the back catalogue as well. Uh, Marion and Judith, uh, welcome. Welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. Um, I, Sally. It's really great to see you. Judith, of course, is in Melbourne uh, as well, but uh, Marion, you're, you're brightening us all up with your reflected Sydney uh, uh, light. It's uh, lovely to have you here. Um, I, let's begin uh, because your stories come at the same problem in different ways and in very different time frames. Um, so I'd like to be asking each of you, Marion, you can go first, about when the story begins for you in talking about climate change in Australia. Well, I start my story back at the time of Kyoto. And the reason I wanted to do this is so many things came together at that time. It was a time when we definitively, I guess, decided that we were going to, as a country, align ourselves with essentially the Republican view on climate change coming out of the US. And the other thing that was very important to me was it was around Kyoto in 1997 that the dividing line really happened on science and the importance of the science sceptics. And early on in the book, I describe a conversation with one of America's leading climate change sceptics, and, and he explained that they had decided, uh, the sceptic groups in America, that they had to challenge the science of climate change. Otherwise, basically, the moral imperative of doing something would lie with the people who wanted to act on climate change. And that was a really big thing for them. And they engaged the Australian climate sceptics in that endeavour to basically question and challenge climate science. And that was all going on at the same time. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that really interesting uh, aspect of your work about the relationship with the US, but uh, Judy, over to you first. Okay, well, I begin with wool. <laughs> and because what I 
um, wanted to do with um, this essay was to try to put the sort of position that Australia's got to on climate change into a longer narrative of our economic history. Because it's, it seems to me that um, the fact that we're so dependent, we're a fossil fuel exporting nation um, or economy explained a lot of the sort of political momentum behind where we got to. And why I said I begin with wool, I mean, Australia has ex as basically as an exporting nation or our exports have primarily been unprocessed primary commodities. So they started off with wool. When wool basically tanked in the in the in the 1950s, we were lucky enough that we had minerals, and so first iron ore, and then coal and liquid nitric not liquid liquid natural gas. Sorry. Um, so you know re replaced it. We stayed being a primary exporting unprocessed primary commodities, and so and with a very weak manufacturing sector in terms of our exports so that that was this much longer time frame to try to i want i wanted to some extent to um move a little bit away from the sort of um very detailed sort of work that that marion did and so i think they dovetail very well um mm. to, to try to get a a sense of where of why in terms of our history why we've ended up where we are um, it, it's so interesting that early history of protectionism too, that, that when you, you write yeah. about, um, playing golf, the tariff board could do more for a firm's prosperity than actually overseeing the development of a new product. And, uh, this, this I, idea that there's a long history really of, of, of resistance to change. I think um, in Australia, but um, I wonder, Judy, if you can expand a bit on on that quote, that that idea that because and and then for Marion um, to answer, is the Carbon Club sort of a modern version of that um, that where these personal relationships um, can actually outbid science and uh, what communities actually desire, Judy? Yes, so the, the quote that, that Sally um, has, which comes from the period when Australia, after, after the Second World War, Australia decided that it needed to have a sophisticated manufacturing sector, which we basically going into the Second World War, we didn't have. Um, we also decided we needed a bigger population. And these, these, these two policies dovetail. The, um, the, if we were to have lots of people come here because we had to populate or perish, we had to have jobs for them. We were going to provide the jobs through expanding the manufacturing sector. Foreign companies were going to invest and we were going to protect that manufacturing sector. The manufacturing was going to be for the domestic market, not for export. And that was that's the crucial point that I was trying to make. So that the, um, the the companies were then protected by tariffs, and a huge amount of effort went into lobbying to make to get you know the tariffs on your shoes and 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 particular machinery and and that sort of thing. And even from the certainly from the early sixties, there was economists arguing that this was starting to really hold Australia the Australian economy back because because our manufacturing was protected, it was becoming uncompetitive in world terms. So Australians were paying a lot for products that were in some ways inferior. Um, I remember when I went to England for the first time in the 19, uh, very early 1970s, the availability of clothes, you know, just all sorts of things. Whereas now, with we have global brands and you don't feel that you know being able to buy your clothes in london is going to make much difference um so you know and and so that that protection and in a way you write like it was lobbying for the keeping the politicians true to the creed of protection that's what the manufacturers were focusing on rather than developing their products and so, Marion, what you write about is this, um, I mean, this club, this 
club um, vested interests and individuals. I mean, um, there are some uh, superstar individuals that have been able to really um, influence uh, state policy for, for decades now. Um, a bit more about well, how yes. that has come to be. Well, certainly in the early part of the book, in fact, right through um, to about the end of the Abbott era, I, I do think that one of the key figures in this was Hugh Morgan, who I know is very well known to you Melbournians, not so much in the rest of Australia. But Hugh Morgan's role was critical because I think a lot of people in the past have seen him as this uh, you know, godfather of the new right, if you like, in Australia, um, tilting at trade union rights and land rights and things like that. But I kind of try to reposition him, him a bit because he was utterly crucial in the hierarchy of the Liberal Party, both federally in Victoria and to some extent in Western Australia. And I remember one of the people, one of his former colleagues that I interviewed, saying to me that Hugh and his friends kind of epitomised the thinking of the Melbourne Club. They were utterly convinced that the wealth of the country, the power of the country came from the resources sector and the fossil fuel industries or the industries, the mining um, interests that profited from the fossil fuel uh, interests. And they, they did not want to be shifted on that and they could not see another vision for Australia. And there was this um, very interesting meeting that a number of the senior leaders, business leaders had with John Howard, I think it was around 2005. And the question was, you know, which way Australia was going to go on its energy policy. And not only did they back uh, the, the uh, expansion of the LNG industry, the liquefied nat natural gas industry, but they also uh, absolutely disparaged the idea of looking at renewable energy as a possible way of lowering emissions on a, on a large scale. And when I looked back, uh, when I was writing the book, at the internal memos and notes on this that these executives produced, you could really see that the mentality was that they could not envisage a different path for Australia. And that's what I found so interesting. And that mentality really had seized, I think, the top of the Liberal Party, the National Party, and also significant elements of the Labor Party. There was, could I just uh, say that? I think, please, yeah. That, that one of the things that's, that's interesting there was at that moment that you're talking about, Marion, they believed that renewables would only really take off if there was a huge amount of government, if government policy um, promoted it and allowed it. And so it sort of, fitted with their neoliberal ideology at that point that we don't want the government interfering in the way in which the market is distributing resources and i so i you know found that very interesting because in fact that's all changed now because now renewables yes. have fallen so much in price that that they're now um like people defending horses when the automobiles are on the road and the other thing that was so interesting was that they were so hostile to the idea of the government uh, subsidising or creating policies to expand renewable energy that they felt was intervening in the market. But at exactly the same meetings, they were sitting there saying, why don't you put a whole heap of government dollars into carbon capture and storage for the coal industry. So there was this wonderful disconnect where if the subsidies were going to renewable energy, that was intervening in the market. If it was going to keeping the coal industry alive in the future with carbon capture and storage, that was a good investment of taxpayer dollars. There was some dress rehearsal in, in, in some ways too for the, 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 the climate campaign, the anti-climate uh, campaign in Indigenous land rights uh, as well that um, so 
sort of provided a model was how I read this for the the campaign against climate action as well. Um, Judy, do you want to talk about about that? Yes, I mean, I, I felt that, um, and living through the 1980s, it seemed to me that the mining industry and the Australian, what was it then called, the Australian Mining Industry Council, or the mine, anyway, keeps mining, what is it called now, the mining industry, anyway, um, that they had basically stopped the momentum of reconciliation in its tracks in, in the 80s and 90s. It's something that I think was unforgivable. But um, the the thing about mining is it doesn't actually employ huge numbers of people, despite what you would think from Joel Fitzgibbon and co. Um, so they, they embarked on a big public relations campaign to stop uniform land rights, which would have which the, the legislation that the Labor government in the 1980s was considering would have given Indigenous um, owners much stronger um, rights in relation to they, what we can talk about as a veto right. They were, would be able to not give permission, to refuse permission to for, my, for mining explorers to come onto their land. And this obviously was a huge threat to the mining industry and they campaigned vociferously against it. They then campaigned against, uh, after Mabo, they campaigned against Keating's native title legislation. And in doing that, they really honed their public relations skills because what they had to do was to convince Australians that they that their interests in some way would actually be threatened by these things that were happening up in the Northern Territory or in Western Australia, far away from them. And we, we get, um, because Indigenous owners would have had slightly stronger um, property title, property rights than, than ordinary Australians, because with freehold title, miners can come in, as many farmers are finding out, and, and, and explore and mine. Um, we had the beginning of this, the rule of law should be the same for everybody, no special rights for Indigenous Australians. And it was extraordinarily successful, you know, that they something that was actually about defending a very their vested interests got turned into a general narrative about there should be no, no special treatment for Indigenous Australians. And they really honed their public relations skills. They've got deep pockets. They ran huge, you know, they ran television ads, campaigns, and it finished with you know, John Howard holding up a map of Australia and saying, all of this will be under native title, won't be able to mine, you won't, the, the state governments won't have money to pay for schools. You know, they were extraordinarily successful. And it gave them the confidence, I mean, it gave them skills and the confidence that they could win, you know, that they would, they could actually turn a political movement around. This, this really caught my interest in, in both of your works, this um, how emboldened, uh, you know, and it, you, you think about the, the one that always gets me is the, the mining tax, the super tax that yeah. uh, Rudd and Swan tried to introduce and that, you know, the, the majority of the Australian people end up saying, oh, no, we, we don't want to tax the incredibly rich mining sector to benefit us all. Um, I mean, it it, it was it's a form of magic, but of course it's not magic. And um, the story of the, the Indigenous land rights connection was interesting to me. And as to, um, really interesting, Marion, this connection with the US, that, that this is actually a very slick playbook um, and where the connections are, are very much there between individuals, organisations, institutions, um, in order to... To, to make sure that Australia, well, never has a climate change policy. Were you surprised, Marion, at the extent of those connections? Well, I, I had gone to Washington to do some uh, interviews around this because I knew that this was uh, a very, very a big part of what happened in Australia. But some uh, some of the key players in this, Corey, people like Corey Bernardi, were willing to sit down 
with me and go through what happened at the time, particularly during the campaigns against Malcolm Turnbull, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, and also uh, his um, one of his colleagues in the US, Tim uh, Andrews, who'd, who'd worked uh, or had been trained at the uh, Koch Brothers uh, Training Institute in Washington. And they sort of explained the strategy to me. And it was, I was surprised how deeply rooted it was within the Republican right, but also in those uh, right wing, uh, very successful conservative lobby groups in Washington. And this to me, became very interesting when I began reading some of the speeches that were delivered to defeat uh, Obama's climate agenda and the congressional climate agenda in Washington. And almost some of the same words, the same phraseology was being used against Rudd in Canberra and then Gillard in Canberra. That to me was very interesting. And the ties on both sides were, were in a way much deeper than I realised at the time. There's so many opportunities that have gone to waste in 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 this story. I, I mean, I I always think of um, when Rudd and Turnbull were the leaders of their respective parties. That for that you know five minutes we had the two sort of intellectuals of their parties, the two outsiders of their parties, um, that in some ways these these unusual aspects gave an opportunity, of course, that, that um, completely fell apart. Uh, today, uh, we, just today, Kevin Rudd writing in the paper that, you know, Scott Morris Morrison will be desperately hoping for a Trump victory in the United States because otherwise uh, Australia is going to be left on its own um, in, as, a, as a sort of middling country in this, in this story. Um, how much do the individuals matter and how much of it is a, a structural um, and peculiarly Australian um, culture? Do you think? Um, That's a very big question. <laughs> well, um, look, uh, you go ahead, Judith, on that no, one. No, no, you go first. Well, I was just going to say clearly it's both. Clearly it's both. But individuals are very, very important, as we saw in Malcolm Turnbull's case. And uh, the passions that were unleashed about Turnbull's removal first in 2009, that really surprised me. Even now, going back interviewing the key players who were involved, there was there was a, a, an absolute overwhelming uh, position that he was driving what they saw as this huge green agenda in the Liberal Party. They felt this was foreign to the Liberal Party and it had to be removed. Uh, and one of the things that really struck me in this is that you have these individual forces who come along and actually try to change the history on this, but there is a structure there and that structure is, of course, the vested interests of all the corporations, uh, the, uh, the workers, uh, the towns, the regions that all depend on fossil fuel industries and, and all the, the economies that are around them. So what I thought happened in the end was that key players in what I call the carbon club would come and go depending on whether the legislation or the program or the policy going through disrupted their vested interests. But then at the core, you had individuals driving the case not to change. And that is how I'd see it. I think um, Kevin Rudd has to take some responsibility too for the breakdown with, with Turnbull. He basically let let he he pushed Turnbull too hard. He thought, you know, that this that that he could that the that the Liberal Party would split on it, which it did, and that somehow, you know, he, he put politics ahead. With, so that five minute moment that was there when he probably when Turnbull still had more authority, I think he delayed. But I would then say 
that being the case, um, the fossil fuel capital is deserting fossil fuels. So that for all of the individual triumphs that the Carbon Club has had, they've delayed things, but they haven't actually stopped what I think is probably a fairly inevitable change. Um, and Australia is going to be in a really bad position unless we get some some good leadership on this. Um, because if the world, or, you know, as the rest of the world wakes up to the really serious catastrophes that we're, we're, we're likely to face, there will be a move away from fossil fuels. And we haven't been prepared for it. We haven't um, we haven't had our governments leading us to develop replacement industries. It's like we try. We hoped that the world would keep wearing wool and sleeping under wool blankets for the next decades, but that, but it didn't. You know, so I, I think that there are bigger historical forces at work, both the realization about about what's happening with the climate, but also there's now a technological imperative that's driving. The, the the uptake of renewables because it's actually turning out to be much 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 cheaper than was ever envisaged back in 2009 2010 and i think this is pretty unstoppable that's where the new entrepreneurial energy is that's where the excitement is and that's where capital is starting to move to so i think in the end for all they did you know they will be just looked on as people who actually probably damaged Australia's long-term future. Um, Judy, you wrote that just as important as the, the deniers are the, the minimisers, um, the people that have um, uh, been really successful in, in creating a belief that the science is contestable. In some ways that seems to have been um, one of the greatest wins of of the people that don't want to see a climate change uh, policy, this idea that the science is is up for grabs, which so many institutions, including Marion the ABC, I think, for a long time bought into it to it or, or grappled, not bought into it, but but grappled with, you know, do we need to have a denier to balance? Um, you, you know th this person who's who's promoting uh, the science that it, it 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 allowed the idea of it being contestable to be um, discussed. Now, I, I'm imagining if this was the case with the coronavirus and what what um, a government the federal government response if it had been similar to the science this virus, um, what what might it have looked like, Judy, do you think? Well, look, I was just going to say another point before you got onto that, is, which is I think what was very clever about that is that was a, that idea that somehow we have to keep an open mind, you know, scepticism linked in with, with um, ideas about freedom of speech, that somehow, you know, so it it, it linked to another value that, that a lot of, you know, that's very important for our democracy. But it was epistemologically naive, you know, like we don't, every time we get into an aeroplane, we don't think, hmm, let's have a bit of a debate about, you know, the science of aerodynamics. We don't, we don't with, you know, it was, it was a very cynical um, move, I always thought, that, that played, I mean, most people don't know a lot about science. Um, you know they and as you're saying with the coronavirus we're, we've got you know we're, we're trusting the scientists but i think it was that link in with ideas about freedom of speech and of course i mean and of course at some level there's things about science that are always contestable but there's all sorts of things that aren't contestable and it was i thought it was it was mischievous in many ways but it was also sort of ignorant it was like it was I put it in the same category as the arguments about whether or not climate change causes bushfire, as if the only cause of a bushfire is whoever lit the match or the lightning strike. You know that that of course there's there's mu there's many causation is quite a complex thing, and there's so it would and again there was that similar incredible sort of naivety that that people like Tony Abbott and Peter Dutton were pursuing. Um, Probably, you know, it shows their lack of philosophical reflection and sophistication, but it it, it was 
it, you know, it's plausible to a lot of people, those sorts of arguments. Mm -hmm. yeah. So back on the, the coronavirus, the, I mean, I think that's been, that's hopeful in a way, at least, at least the politicians have stopped knocking science because they've actually realised how much the sort of very interdependent industrial society we've got and with the high levels of global mobility, how much we're actually going to be, we're very dependent on this extremely high level sophisticated science to protect us from the coronavirus. Do, do you agree, Mariam, that it's a, a, a potential circuit breaker that, you know, we've all um, been minded how important it's been reminded about how many things in Australia we no longer can make for ourselves like surgical masks for the first half of this year and ventilators and mind you we're able to do it which is impressive but um, are you optimistic or um, pessimistic that when this uh, nightmare is over um, every monitor be clutching to it, just get back to where we were and that the idea that, you know, we're going to create a, a brand new glorious community uh, driven, wonderful, self-sustaining future is just a um, something that Melbourne people talk about because they can't go out anymore. <laughs> Uh, say that again, Marion. I'm not sure if your sound dropped out. No, we've lost yeah, you. you. What about? Yeah. Uh, have a have a uh, have one more go. Yeah. No, we've lost your sound. Have a little play. A little play. Don't go away. And while you do, perhaps Judy, you can have a go at answering that question and. Um, and I'll see if I can hear anything from Mary in the meantime. Well, look, so, I think one of the things there that you alluded to, Sally, that I think the, the, the COVID pandemic has done is it's really revealed um, the weakness of our manufacturing sector. You know, when I started the quarterly essay, started thinking about it back last, I was going to say last century, feels like that, last, at the end of last year, um, People weren't talking about how we couldn't make anything, but now with with since COVID, we're, we've been talking about it a lot, and I think it's been a real shock. And we've now got an industry minister, Karen Andrews, who is actually, I think she's a, an engineer. You know, she's engineer, really focused yeah. on engineering, on engineering, and she seems to actually get it in a way that um, I, I've felt that the Liberals have been incredibly weak on industry policy. Really, um, certainly ever, ever, ever since, um, well, they were pretty weak under Howard, but they, they certainly under Abbott, since Abbott has basically just seemed to have disappeared. So I think that's quite hope. You know, she's she's quite hopeful and sort of serious, and she's not a she's not a, a climate change ideologue. Um, how how so, remarkable that somebody actually linked to their uh, portfolio in their expertise could be no, doing something. a noticeably uh, good job. Marion, can you hear us? Ah, okay. So I think what you're saying is that you try and uh, plug yeah, your headphones. Is that any ah, better? Ah, that's yeah. better. Yeah. You're back. Okay. You're I'm back, back you, with you. Could, could, I don't know what could happened you hear there. Us? But could I you could hear indeed. Us? Yeah. All right. So would uh, you like to you can respond to any bit of that that um uh that you like, but it came off this idea of the pandemic, you know, the post pandemic future uh, and and climate change. Well, I think that we're going into a very interesting debate on this and I think this will play out especially in October and November this year when we see the budget and when we see Angus Taylor's uh, technology roadmap. Uh, there, there is, I think, at the moment a, a feeling that we part, part of the country really wants to go down the gas-led recovery route. And I think we're hearing this in the media all the time. Obviously, people in the press gallery are being briefed on this. Uh, some of the union leaders have come out strongly for it. 
On the other hand, we're seeing both uh, some state liberal politicians, some labor politicians, and certainly uh, key business figures saying exactly what Judith was saying before, we want to see a different Australia. We want to have a vision of a different Australia, which moves to a clean energy economy and a manufacturing industry that's potentially powered by a clean energy economy. That debate, I think, is going to really play out over the next year. And where that goes, uh, for me, is going to be probably uh, the determining, uh, at least for this government, the determining time when we, when we see whether we're going to go back to the future of what we've had, uh, both under John Howard and Tony Abbott, or whether we're going to go in a new direction. And a lot, I think, will hang on that. And I think um, it's not just yeah. um, about manufacturing here. The other, uh, I, mean, it, I think, really quite exciting possibility that's now on the table is that we can become an energy exporter by exporting renewable energy. So Mike Cannon-Brooks has invested heavily in this um, solar huge solar farm outside of Tennant Creek and the idea is that the energy that's made there renewable energy will will go by cable to Singapore and just today in the paper he was talking about the fact that we could have a, a cable that linked Western Australia where the sun shines for three hours longer than it does over here in, in on the east so that when we're all cooking our dinner and things between, you know, five and eight at night. The sun's still shining over there and so renewable energy can be piped over here. So, and Ross Garner has also talked about this, this idea that we can become an energy superpower. So it's like, okay, we went from wool to minerals and we could go from minerals to renewable energy. So we would still be an energy exporting nation, but we would be exporting renewable energy and we would still be using our natural resources um, but we'd be using wind and 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 sun, and it, because it follows the sort of economic logic of the way in which our economy has worked, I think it's got a lot. A, it's it's very powerful, um, and capital is moving. That I mean, so you know, Angus Taylor can be going around briefing the journalists all he likes, but it's it's also where invest people making investments are going to make making their decisions. And just on another thing, I mean, it seems to me that's probably or perhaps one of the reasons that the Liberals are going after the superannuation funds is that this, that that superannuation funds have now are now big capital investors and they some of them are starting to put pressure on things on, on companies about um, their climate policies. You know that that this is capital that capital that is actually controlled more by progressives than than the liberals are used to seeing and um the, and there's a there's a lot of this in, investor activism now um you know and so there's it, I, th I sort of feel as if they're still very you know it's quite right the fossil fuel industry is still very powerful but they're pushing back now they're holding back the dike in some way you know that that um, there's, there's, that, that's, there's the a potential, that's me being optimistic, and a, and a potential too that you know these carbon-based tariffs from other countries, particularly exactly. the EU, um, yeah. uh, might come. Well, were looking to come into play before the the next uh, meeting was it in Glasgow or some was was mm -hmm. was postponed. Um, do you share that optimism, Marion? And and also, how dependent is it uh, on this election in the United States that you know if Donald Trump were yeah. to win a second term, uh, Australia then has this great ally in its in its do nothing uh, climate change policy. Um, how how much is dependent on that? I think so much is dependent on that at the moment. I think if Trump does win the White House again, that the um, this will create big problems for any ideas about carbon tariffs. I think you just have to look at the way the European countries have 
had such difficulty with trying to reform the uh, the power and the taxation um, tax evasion um, avoidance policies of the big American tech companies to uh, and to see the EU uh, constantly butting up against the White House on this if Trump uh, does get returned to the White House I think it will put back uh, the climate policy in Australia and globally quite a bit because the other point of course is that China will and, and India but China in particular will not feel that pressure coming from the US. On the other hand if Biden does win the election his climate change program is in fact uh, very going to be quite problematic for Australia because it does also look at carbon tariffs but quite interestingly, the other point in there is that it looks to providing support uh, for legal cases in the courts against companies that do pursue uh, do pursue profit at the expense of um, the uh, emissions. Uh, targets and at, at the expense essentially of action on climate change. If that happens, that's going to put uh, a lot of um, pressure on Australian companies and, you know, Australian exports. So I think that a Biden presidency will have a, a big impact on what happens in climate policy here. And the, the Carbon Club seem um, fairly immune to um, uh, international shaming. Uh, and in fact, Australian, you, you, you know, certain sections of Australian politics do. Dark Victory 17 years ago um, reminds us of that. But when it hits the bottom line, when it affects uh, the, the implications for trade, um, it, that does seem to be a, a, a sort of potential um, area, Judy, where would well be forced into it. Is that is that? I think so. Your yeah. Reading? Yes, I mean, and, and like, it's just hard to read. Scott, I find Scott Morrison quite hard to read on this in many ways because I don't think he's particularly ideological. Um, he, he seems to me a bit of a sort of policy neutral zone in, in many ways. Um, so I think that if, if uh, I think he's quite capable of pivoting on this in a way that somebody like Tony Abbott and John Howard weren't. Don't, uh, so that if the external environment changed radically, um, he may be, um, he, he may change. Um, you know, like people have put a lot on the, the COVID commission that he um, appointed and we don't know what the process was of appointed, but it just seemed to sort of appear like a jack-in-a-box almost. And it, it struck me that it was something that he hadn't put, that wasn't very thoughtfully done. You know, there was no representatives from the service sector. Um, there was none of the younger entrepreneurs on it. It was it was like he, he you know, it just seemed a bit reactive. So. I mean, I guess, you know, we just have to wait and see what happens with America. But we're also running out of time, you know, that in mm. terms of the, the 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 way the climate's changing. And so the, I thought that Marion might have been going to say when she said about, you know, depends what happens in October, November, depends whether we get another lot of bushfires. I mean, I think I saw there were bushfires in New South Wales again already. In Ballarat um, today. I was at Ballarat. I knew there was bushfires mm. somewhere. Um, so you know that 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 these um, we're talking about trends with all of these things. So that's and that's hard for people um, to understand. But I think the evidence, the, the, the cumulativeness of of these bushfire seasons, is starting to really freak people out and and make them realise there is something serious happening with the climate. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's, yes. that's another sort of pressure that's coming in on us. I, I guess for me, in looking at this over a period of the last 20 years, the question that I, I was left with by the end of the book was what, what sort of time frame 
are the Australian politicians and Australian business and Australian banks. What time frame are they looking at? Because what was made clear at the last um, climate conference in Madrid, what's been made clear in the last IPCC reports, what's been made clear in the last CSIRO and um, Bureau of Meteorology reports here on the state of our climate, is that essentially we are looking at this decade, the, these 2020s, mm -hmm. uh, to decide what whether we're serious about this aim of trying to keep the temperature will rise well below two degrees. And so whenever I hear people say, look, um, let's go for the 20, 2050 uh, carbon neutral target, the New South Wales government's done it, the Business Council of Australia's done it, the Farmers Federation has done it. I actually want to know what the 2030 targets are. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. once we start talking about that, in Canberra, in the Morrison government, uh, in, you know, not the current targets we have, but real 2030 targets. And once we start talking about that in the Business Council and the Minerals Council, then I think I will believe that we're actually going to have a real a debate on this uh, by both parties in this, both major parties in this country. Nine years away, um, and we're in the greatest global economic shock, mm. uh, in, you know, decades and decades, uh, and we don't know when it's going to end. Um, is it, 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 I find it so difficult to imagine at the moment um, that, that it, there's going room for this to take priority in the years to come, particularly in a country like Australia, history on this issue, um, that what we're going to hear about is rebuilding the economy and it's going to be about going back, back to the, the tried and true, um, you know, digging stuff out of the ground and sending it off to reboot other people's economies as well. It's so hard for me to imagine um, that, that this conversation could take the time frame you've just mentioned, Marion. Is there something I'm missing other than, of course, the incredible urgency of it, um, you know, for, for this to take place? Is there something I'm, uh, Judy, perhaps you can maybe feel, I'm sorry to be the pessimist, but I'm deeply pessimistic about this. Yes, I mean, I, I find, like I, I read the papers every morning, that I fluctuate between pessimism and optimism. You know, there's, there's things there for, for both. Um, look, we can still be digging iron ore out of the ground. Uh, and iron ore is, I mean, iron ore is now really our only export staple, apart from the fossil fuels, because, because COVID has done for the international education and for tourism for the foreseeable future. I think maybe what you're missing is um, the flight of capital from fossil fuels. If we were in an authoritarian uh, society, we'd have no hope because we'd have a government that would just defend the way things were. But actually they don't control the whole of the economy and capital is deserting fossil fuels at a very great rate and moving towards renewables. Now, in Australia, that could be helped by government policy, but it's it's sort of happening anyway. So whether whether it's going to ha happen fast enough, I mean, I, I actually, I feel, really, I have to say I feel deep down quite pessimistic, but one has to live with hope and optimism because you can't, you can't function and you can't, you know, enjoy children and you know, enjoy enjoy life in a way. Um, but I think that is perhaps what you're missing, is that we're not in an authoritarian society and the government doesn't call all the shots on this. Um, it's a slightly alarming answer, isn't it? <laughs> um, the the um, incredible need for us to all, wherever are in the world, protect our democracies. Um, uh, no matter how strong and robust we, we think they are. Ma Marion, can you come up with anything slightly more, um, uh, I mean, without wanting to, I, I don't want to 
that you have a conversation about a terrible problem for an hour and then you just sign off on the hopeful note because otherwise people will yeah. um, just be crying. It's not That's not what I'm asking for um, uh, because the answer no, might and, be no, um, you don't, you know. No, I, I am weirdly, I am incredibly optimistic and one of the things I think that happens uh, especially in the climate change area, you go along, and this is what I found when I was researching the book, you go along for a few years and you think things are absolutely going nowhere. Um, in the Howard period, in the uh, Abbott period, and then suddenly, kaboom, something happens and you get this huge burst of activity and involvement and engagement not only by the public, which has a huge influence on the politicians, but by business as well. And I think we certainly saw that after the bushfires here, as Judith mentioned, and had it not been for the COVID uh, pandemic, I think that we would have seen a lot more flow from that. But equally, I think even in Howard's time, we saw the way he had to turn on a dime in a sense because of the drought, because of the impact of that, but also things like, you know, the Al Gore movie um, and the enormous uh, public pressure. We saw Tony Abbott put under pressure because Obama managed to do a deal with President Xi over climate in the lead up to Paris. So you see these things and you see that actually a lot can happen in a short period of time even after years of uh, inertia. And I think that the, um, that the change will become more and more rapid. And in fact, I only have to look at my poor benighted industry of journalism. You know, when I uh, was still at the Sydney Morning Herald, it was an incredibly wealthy newspaper, as was The Age, making buckets of money from their uh, classified mm. ads, mm. that all turned uh, very quickly, but the media survived. We're re remaking ourselves. And I think Australia will remake itself and has enormous opportunities, but you have to bring people with you and you have to bring all those small communities in regional Australia with you because otherwise, as I show quite painfully in the book, they're the people who get wedged uh, that's where the root, really brutal politics and toxic politics of climate change gets really exploited. So, mm. um, yeah, I think, but I, I, I am definitely optimistic. Um, there's a ton of detail about the book, um, The Carbon Club. Actually, you just mentioned Al Gore before and reminded me of that Oh, the scenes with um, Clive Palmer and Al Gore, yeah. which I'll leave people to read in the book. I mean, honestly, you just need a shower after reading that. Uh, it's about the deals that people have to do and the, um, the, the, the compromises. It's what it's going to be about in the end, end of this. And Judy, you're right. it's, it's, about, it's about some sort of compromise. Or some of them are a bit more grubby than others. Um, the coal course, curse, what, the coal curse, uh, resources, climate and Australia's future, Judy's quarterly essay, The Carbon Club, at the readings bookshop, uh, go online and um, they will send them out to you beautifully. Um, I, and they really are wonderful to, to read together. Um, it was a, a deep deep uh, dive back into the, the history, um, but also the culture and this very uh, particular uh, Australian story, isn't it, that uh, hopefully will be uh, solved with the, the kind of tenacity and brains that, you know, we seem to be bringing on the whole to the, the COVID-19 problem and, uh, you know, perhaps I can take some optimism in that as well. Um, it's a great thrill to see the two of you um, together uh, for, for the conversation tonight, and I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody uh, watching does it as well. And don't forget, um, everyone who's watching, to go to the Wheeler website as well, because there is an archive there that could keep you through a lockdown for eternity. Um, 
and something there for every mood, uh, every evening. So check out the Wheeler website and readings, and uh, you'll be you'll be completely sorted. Judith Brett, Marion Wilkinson, thank you so much, and uh, hope we can come together in person with our beloved audience. Uh, not too far down the track. We miss you so much at the Wheeler Centre, every one of us. So take care until we're all together and uh, we'll see you soon. Good night. No. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Sam. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.